instructions, as well as uh, indicated, the instructions to Adam and me were to provide a 10-minute introduction about uh, where and why we blog and what got us into it, uh, why we blog particularly about the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and whether blogging should be considered activism or journalism or, or both. Uh, now I'm not particularly comfortable about talking by myself uh, about myself, and I can see a little reason why others uh, uh, should be interested, in, but orders are orders, uh, so I will briefly comply before we can move on to the actual issues, and I'll raise some of the issues in the course of this. I began blogging last uh, December, being an academic. I could only come up with a pedestrian name for the blog, which is the U.S. and Israel, uh, and which can be found at, uh, predictably, jeromeslater.com. Now, there were then, and, and even more so now, a growing number of uh, excellent blogs that uh, deal with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as well as with uh, U.S. policies towards Israel, especially, I may say, uh, Mando Weiss, and uh, when the, the mood strikes him, which is often, uh, Steve Walt. Uh, so it, it may well be asked, I ask myself, uh, what purpose a new one would have. Well, my hope was that as an academic who had been teaching and writing about this matter, mostly for professional journals and professional political scientists and historians, my hope was that I could provide a historical perspective uh, that would complement both activism and journalism. In particular, I think that there is a gap, and it's an unnecessary gap, between shorter daily comments that quickly react to recent events and long articles written for professional journals. So my hope is to, uh, to help bridge this gap uh, by writing shorter essays, principally in the four to 5,000 word range, uh, in which I, uh, based on research and scholarship, not mine or others, uh, but aimed at general audiences, not written in academic prose, and reasonably closely tied to current events instead of things which are going to appear two years later, if at all, in a professional journal which is only going to be read by a handful of <laughs> professionals interested in the topic. But just as one example, a couple months after the publication of the Goldstone Report, I wrote uh, two fairly long analyses of it on my, on my blog. Now, aside from that, in addition from time to time, when some especially outrageous event occurs, I mean, outrageous events in this topic are daily, but an, 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 one particularly outrageous one appears, or there's some uh, particularly noxious right-wing uh, article is published, or there's a typical, typically misleading and half-truthy New York Times uh, story appears. I'm unable to resist commenting on it in shorter pieces that are more typical of the blogging world. Now, the problem with my type of blog, of course, is that it doesn't appear on any regular or predictable basis, uh, unlike... Uh, Mondo Weiss and Steve Walt, who I uh, don't dream of going a day without uh, reading. Um, so it's difficult to gain a regular readership. But there is a terrific figure of uh, feature of blogging programs, including the program I use, which allows interested readers to sign up to be notified when, by email when a new blog appears. So they don't have to just check it. If something comes out that looks interesting, they'll get an email and decide whether they want to read it. So why do I blog on this particular issue? Uh, over the course of my life, gone, I've gone through three phases about Israel. Coming of age of, in New York City in the uh, 1940s, immediately after the Holocaust and with anti-Semitism still alive in America, I thought of myself as a fervent Zionist. I guess in a sense I still am something of a Zionist, although a lot less fervent. Uh, since I regarded the case for the creation of a Jewish state, if nothing else than as a refuge for persecuted Jews, as a compelling one. Because this immediately gets to the problem of where, uh, and so I never thought of it as, the case is not necessarily in the land that's already populated by others, uh, obviously the Palestinians. Uh, so you have to separate those two components, difficult as it, as it may be to do. Now, in light of the history of the Jewish people, perhaps this bedrock principle of Zionism, a refuge for Jews who really need a refuge, is still, if not compelling, at least not to be dismissed, understanding the long history involved. However much it has been betrayed, and betrayed is the right word, as far as I'm concerned, by Israel. 
Uh, while, while still in my first phase as a fervent Zionist, at the end of the 1950s, I served as an anti-submarine warfare officer on a U.S. destroyer. And in the late 1950s, Egypt bought four subs from the Soviet Union. So I wrote to the Israeli embassy, and I volunteered to serve as the new, as an ASW officer on one of the Israeli destroyers in the event a new war broke out with Egypt before the Israelis could train their own people. But at the same time, my views began to change, and I entered into my second phase. Why? Three things occurred. First, I began to <laughs> read about, uh, in a serious way, the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, as opposed to its mythology, which I, as almost everybody else, had accepted. Secondly, it soon became apparent that after the ninth, soon after the 1967 war, Gamal Abdel Nasser, before Sadat, was seeking to end the conflict, both of them, but they were being stonewalled. Uh, at that point, I felt like uh, writing to Golda Meir and saying that if Israel blundered into an unnecessary war with Egypt, which of course it soon did, on me she should no longer depend. <laughs> And third, at the same time, Foreign Affairs published George Ball's famous article, How to Save Israel in Spite of Herself, and it had a quite profound influence on me. These three factors impelled me into my second uh, phase, the tough love phase, hoping that truth-telling would eventually convince the Israelis, and equally as important, uh, probably the American Jewish community, that Israel was on the road to both a moral and security disaster and needed to come to terms with the historical truth as the first step, actually the sine qua non, of saving itself. But in the last few years, and, and this is quite hard to admit, let alone to say out loud, I no longer believe that tough love can work, and I no longer can say truly that I love Israel, as opposed, of course, to the many wonderful and courageous Israelis uh, who still resist what their country has become. I no longer think Israel can be saved from itself, and it certainly cannot happen unless the American Jewish community itself, with its enormous influence on American policies, uh, comes to grip with the true history of the conflict. So in short, Israel is no longer on the road to a moral and security disaster. It is already there and I see no realistic prospect that it can reverse course. It is hard to see how a two-state solution can be reached, and the one-state uh, solution, in quotes, to my mind is no solution at all but a fairy tale which if somehow actually materialized could well be even worse than the present situation. Well, for me, that leads to the obvious question, so why bother to you know, write about it? Well, part of the reason is illustrated by this, this story. Uh, one day the governor was touring the state uh, mental institution and he came across a man who was completely naked except that he had on a very elegant black top hat and beautiful black dress shoes. <laughs> Why do you run around naked, the governor asked. What's the difference, the man responded. Nobody ever comes to see me. Then why the top hat and the dress shoes? Somebody might. <laughs> <laughs> In that spirit, <laughs> I now write in the forlorn hope that truth and justice might yet prevail despite my deep pessimism. But equally, and maybe more so, I also now write in the spirit of uh, not in my name. If you are a completely secular Jew, like me, it is hard to see what the point is of being Jewish if not to uphold the best values of Western civilization. There was a time, ah yes, there was a time when it was widely accepted, and not just by Jews, that the Jewish culture and tradition was one that was particularly committed to the best values of Western civilization, reason, truth, justice. Consequently, when Israel was founded and committed itself to be a light unto the nations, a few people sneered at that. <coughs> no longer, needless to say. The appropriate response to what Israel has become is outrage, and so maybe that's the main reason why I continue to bang my head uh, on this wall. Finally, is this activism or journalism, or both? I don't know, but as a lifelong academic, I prefer to think of it as scholarship in the best sense, the search for knowledge, 
reason, truth, and justice. Thank you.